Good evening, viewers. As for some persons with no one, for all who are tuning in for the first time, my name is Kimbe Copeland, the president for Kimbo, a youth organization for reparations and African development. And this is our television program that is hosted on Channel 11 NCN every second Thursday. Now, this segment is called What is Trending, whereby yours truly is going to take you through some current events concerning reparations and developing stories around people of African descent. Now, approximately two weeks or so, on the daily show, an American statistical news program on Comedy Central, which is hosted by Trevor Noah, who is a South African comedian, writer, producer, political commentator, actor, and television host. Touch on a present day conversation or more so debate presently being had by politicians, journalists, etc. in the United States, titled Should Americans Compensate Descendants of African Slaves? Supporting arguments, some arguments against, and some arguments which I would say makes no sense. Let's get straight into this video and see what's up. Let's talk about slavery. No, white people come back! <laughs> Even today, the topic of slavery still brings up so many hot-button issues. Racism, Confederate statues, and lately, reparations. Should America compensate the descendants of slaves? For a long time, reparations were considered a radical idea. But recently, it's become a lot more mainstream, you know? Sort of like how we used to think hitchhiking was a crazy idea, but now we have a rating system for it and an app, and we're like, yeah, it's fine. Jake didn't murder me, five stars. <laughs> and you can tell how mainstream the idea of reparations has become, because pretty much every single one of the 89 Democrats running for president has gotten on board. Some 2020 Democratic presidential hopefuls are putting a new spin on an old idea, whether to pay direct descendants of slaves. I've long believed that uh, this country should address the original sin of slavery, including by looking at reparations. I think that we have got to address that, um, again, it's back to the inequities. I absolutely believe that we need to have some kind of accounting for the persistent racial inequities today. I believe it's time to start the national, full-blown conversation about reparations in this country. Wow. wow, that is really great to hear. Although, I have my eye on you, Elizabeth Warren. I feel like as soon as reparations are passed, she'll be like, there's something I didn't tell you about my ancestry results. I'm also 120th black, who knew? I accept cash, check, or Apple Pay. Now, it may not come as a surprise, but while Democrats seem to be uniting behind the idea of reparations, people on the right are just as united behind the idea of hell no. It is the party of reparations. Presidential candidates say Americans should be rewarded or punished based on their skin color. My great-great-grandfather, he fought with the Union Army. Do I get a discount? No need to grapple with practical questions about the proposal, like how you determine who receives and who pays for the reparations, how much it would cost, whether Nigerians who just arrived here would benefit. Okay, <laughs> what? That's just a stupid question. Nigerians don't need reparations, all right? They've already been paid by Jussie Smollett, okay? <laughs> what are you talking about? And look, obviously, there are a lot of details that would need to be figured out if America did decide to go with reparations, but that's not a reason to just dismiss it uh, out of hand. Like, you can make anything sound crazy by asking questions in a skeptical tone. I'm, I'm sorry, you wanna have sex? So, so what, you're, you're just gonna put y y a part of you inside a part of me, and, and then what, just pull, put it in, and then pull it out, and do it over and over again? And then what, the penis throws up, and then there's a baby? Uh, I don't know, it doesn't seem very realistic to me. <laughs> and now, surprisingly, there are some folks at Fox News who think there should be reparations, but maybe reparations for white people. They keep blaming America for the sin of slavery, but the truth is, throughout human history, slavery has existed, and America came along as the first country uh, to end it within 150 years. And we get no credit for that. Yeah! How come America doesn't get credit for having slavery for only 200 years? Yeah. They were just watching the video, and it's, very, it's, it's, it's so surprising and appalling to see how people try to justify why slavery was actually good, or why we should not look into reparations. You know, in the, going through this video, they looked at the time lands. It, it was long ago, as the woman who just spoke about why not reparations for white people, for abolishing slavery. Different arguments that we, of course, would get into in more discussion. Now, we want to go into another clip 
that follows directly from this same clip on the, on the Daily Show. And it was titled, For Anyone Confused About Reparations. Coming for the audience, there was a question asked to, Trev uh, direct to Trevor Noah. Do you think that reparations should just go to one group or should it target people in the same kind of like socioeconomic group? Trevor Noah asked for clarity since he was not so clear and the person then responded, well, there are white people that have been disenfranchised recently. While the country has been deindustrialized, so like a lot of people in manufacturing jobs also have been affected. In this clip, Trevor explained what reparations mean and made a distinction between the suffering of people of African descent and the suffering of other races. Let's take a look. So, 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 so to, your question, to your question, I think you have to understand what the word reparations means first. So reparations, you are repairing something that you have broken. You are paying for something that you were supposed to pay for. I'm not saying that there aren't people living in America today who are suffering and are going through pain and strife because of what's happening when it comes to, um, you know, uh, machines taking jobs, uh, factories becoming industrialized, etc. But reparations is a specific conversation about a specific time in America, and that is black people were slaves. You know what I mean? It, I've even heard people say like, oh, but there were some of the Irish who were indentured. Like, yeah, let's slavery. Look at the numbers, look at the time, look at the level of work. You could not work toward your freedom. For most black people in America, this was a time when you were, that was it. You lived and died as a slave. And so that's what reparations is about. And so I hear what you're saying, but I think that's a completely separate conversation that needs to be had about the now. Because if you, if you are not careful, what you then do is you combine everybody's suffering into the same ball and you make it seem like all injustices have the same weighting. And they don't, just like crimes. You know, theft isn't the same as murder. We don't try them the same way. And as much as there is a white person who's suffering today, I feel for anybody who's suffering, because I know what it's like to be poor. I know what it's like to suffer. I didn't come from a wealthy family. We struggled when I was growing up. But I also understand that there are levels of that suffering. You know, and so sometimes white people, it, it, does, it does block a white person because you go, white privilege, and a person goes, I'm poor and I'm white, where's the privilege? You know, white people are like, I wish I could activate my white privilege. I wish I could do it right now. White privilege, give me something. <laughs> I, I get that, I get that, trust me, I get it. It is hard to accept that you have benefits because of the color of your skin if you cannot see the benefits that you have. But the thing I try to explain to a person is, think of it more like golf. Don't think of it as privilege, then think of it like a handicap. Right? In golf, they acknowledge that you are in a position where you need so many advantages to be competitive in the game. Right? So what they say is you have a handicap of 15, so that means like you're going to be hitting from this tee and you get more chances to get the ball in because we understand the position you're in. And if you're a black person in America, from slavery, from day one, the number of injustices that have held black people back in America amount to an insurmountable, like you, you, look at, you look at black people's freedom, you look at black people's land, just, just land alone. The amount of wealth you can, you can acquire over time if you own land is exponential because you have the land, you have the fact that you can borrow based on the land, you have the fact that you can use the money that you have borrowed to grow more wealth, you can use it to grow your family's wealth. Just taking that away from black people alone is crippling them. And so you combine that with slavery and then you look at Jim Crow laws. You didn't let black people in America live in the areas that they wanted to live in. They couldn't get loans from the banks that they wanted to get loans from. And then on top of that, when they started getting the loans from American banks, American banks were found to be giving them higher interest rates when in fact they were the same risk as many of the other races that they were, they were, they were giving loans to. So when you combine all of those things, I think it's safe to say that black Americans have a conversation that they need to be having with the United States doesn't involve me, doesn't involve white people, doesn't, it's like, it's like, yo, American government, meet the black people. That's it. You know, it is very clear that the struggles of African people are different from struggles of other ethnicities. And we have to understand that we as a people came out of a struggle, 400 years or more of enslavement without anything, and then also inherit the present day struggle. So even though there are struggles today that affects everyone in the world, we came from a struggle into a struggle without anything. So that is what we try to put forward in this video. You know, the conversation about enslavement is a total conversation different from all the other struggles that is going on within the world that is different from people of African descent. Now, continuing on what is trending, if I should know it, the British High Commissioner to Jamaica and the Bahamas announced that Britain will compensate the Windrush, the Windrush generation victims. In an article published Saturday, April 16, 2019, titled Bart S. Samuels, Reparations' New President, Windrush Compensation. 
Let's get straight into it. S. Samuels, Reparations New President, Windrush Compensation. Advocates of reparation welcome the announcement that Britain will compensate the Windrush generation victims of its harsh immigration policies, a package totaling £200 million. This was announced by Ashif Ahmad, the British High Commissioner to Jamaica and the Bahamas this week. While we do not have enough detail to comment on the sufficiency of the sum, money has a limited value in paying for decades of discrimination and suffering. There are nonetheless important gains to be acknowledged. Lawyers are guided by the President. We use the principle established in the past cases to guide the claims in current cases, where the facts are similar. Windrush Compensation has established the principle that the descendants of individuals who have died can be compensated for the wrongs suffered by their relatives. When Britain paid compensation won in 2013 for Kenya Mama Freedom Fighters, that payment was to their survivors only, and hence is not as valuable a president as the Windrush payout is to the reparation movement. Our opponents have always sought to argue that all the victims of transatlantic chattel slavery are dead, and so is their claim for compensation. This position was joined with the Limitation of Actions Law, which bars compensation for court action with a lapse of six years after the damage occurred. We have always maintained that chattel slavery, being a crime against humanity, ought not to be shackled by this logistical defense. Finally, we now see where Britain itself has acknowledged the rightness of the payout, not only to the children of descendants when rush victims, but to their ch grandchildren as well. Persons who have no confidence or no belief that we will get any form of reparations. That clip is a proof, or that article is a proof that groups like organizations like Ikimba, the Reparations Committee in Guyana, reparations committees around the, around the Caribbean, the C CRC, which is the CARICOM Reparations Committee, CARICOM and its 10-point plan, the CRR Institute, are being heard and will continue to be heard. Progress is on the verge. So reparations, the whole goal of reparations, reparative justice, is on its way, and we have to prepare ourselves for it. That's why we will continue to advocate for reparations without a stop. Now, continuing on what's trending, and this is the last area, we have the Germany-nominated rapper Nipsey Hussle was killed and shot outside his clothing store in Los Angeles on Sunday afternoon. Hussle was shot multiple times in the parking lot in, in, the parking lot in front of his clothing line at 3.25 p.m. and pronounced dead at the hospital. Nipsey Hussle was, besides being a rapper, was a community-based developing advocate Adv uh, and striving businessman, doing his best to develop the communities. After his death, many celebrities like Snoop Dogg, Mick Mill, Rihanna Drake, LeBron James, John Legend, P. Diddy, just to name a few, spoke out about his sh the shocking news after hearing his death and that he was a great man beyond all of his achievements. We have today also been a very ceremonial day, being his funeral, which happened a few hours earlier today. So we want to get into a little clip of the memorial of his funeral today. So I'm a former teacher at Crenshaw High School and many of my students are very close to Nipsey. I have a family member who is um, who basically was introduced to the music industry by Nipsey Hussle and it's just very close to my heart to be here to show respect to the family, to the fans, to my former students, to my community where I grew up and lived. It was important for me to be here today. Does it surprise you how many people are here? I'm not surprised, but the thing that I am surprised about is the magnitude across the country. In LA, I think everybody expected it to be this way, but um, across the country, I think people are surprised across the world. Um, he is definitely larger in death than he was in life, and everybody sees that now. This gentleman, who has basically been rapping since about 08, 07, um, has done so much in a short time in the industry. Um, it really puts a spotlight on other entertainers in the industry, and I hope that they will give back the way that he has.
as long as we do it live. What do you, what do you push to? Yeah. Uh, he wants to go that way with that. Take a roll line or what? Yeah, yeah, we're we're going to do this and the staple personnel. I'm in love with Yemi and I, that is the meaning. If she just say yes, I'm married. You are talking about marrying that girl. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. Yes. You have to double your husband. Just look at top, you are pushing yourself on top of girls that we are back. <laughs> oh, baby, <laughs> I can't wait to have it in my kingdom. Baby, give me good sleep, with your cute little dimple. Welcome back to Kemba, where we deal with everything youth and African. We just had an amazing segment of what's trending, everything that's trending recently within the African community, especially the youth space. And we know everybody has been talking about Nipsey Hussle's untimely demise. And uh, the last video we showed was a bit of what happened earlier today uh, to commemorate his life. Uh, we are sitting, however, with Miss Ingrid Vidal. We're going to do an exciting interview. Uh, she is a really amazing poet and writes a lot of, really wants to reach out to young people. And so a lot of her poetry uh, is written uh, especially to remind young people of their roots, their history, and their culture. Welcome to a Kemba, Ms. Vidal. Thank you. Good. So let's jump straight into it. Um, just tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, well, well, then I, your poetry. Yes. Um, I was born in Guyana way back many decades ago. Um, I left here when I was about 18 months old and went to England with my parents, um, Samuel and Susan um, Dover, who the, um, the book is um, dedicated to. Um, and I pursued a career in teaching. Um, mum said, mum had a dream. She said, go and get Ingrid. She's got children to teach. And it's a career that I've held very dearly to my heart. Um, and as a teacher of English, I've been able to make use of my poetry within English classrooms, um, written plays as well for young people and at college. But I wanted to take the poetry to a wider audience. And when I decided to um, you know, lead them, my main job in teaching, 2017, I decided, right, I'm going to, I've been saying all the time I'm going to get published, so I did that, um, and then I called the book Make It Shine, which mm -hmm. to me, I called it that title because I felt it takes a bit of effort in order to bring out the best in people, and especially young people who oftentimes um, don't have that much self-belief. Um, and in the UK, especially at the, at the moment, perhaps, and other parts of the world as well. The, I just wanted to really make a difference in helping to improve the achievements, especially of um, students from Caribbean um, and Guyanese backgrounds to help them achieve their best. Um, I think it's, it's definitely something that's on the top of the agenda in, um, in schools in England at the moment to try to do that. And I felt as well, this trip for me, I came here last year launched the book at the library, but this year for me I wanted to return and especially timed it because I knew that the schools would still be open in Guyana um, after ours had finished for Easter to get in there and to have an opportunity to share the poetry with so, schools. So you have been going into schools? Yes, I managed to do that yesterday. I think and initially it was felt that, mm, well, it's, it's exam time, so I thought, okay, that might make it a little difficult, but then I, I approached schools um, as well and I found that 
actually was you know, able to go in because they'd finished their exams and they were ready, if you like, for for something like this. And so I got some very good um, response from the high school that I, I visited yesterday. Um, and the young people were very into the, the rhythms of the poem they felt there. And I think they were quite surprised when initially, having got over my accent, um, I think they were quite surprised that, yes, there was, there was something they could relate to there. And once they were engaged, I think they were with me that, especially as the poetry is very much um, a performance poetry. So it wasn't just sit down and listen to Wordsworth. It was really something that they can engage with in terms of the themes um, to do with, like I said, looking back at heroes and heroines, tributes to um, parents, tributes to young people, like some of the young people I've where, worked with. Where along uh, the line you, the, your, your interest was sparked in history, in, in, in African history specifically? Well, I think having made the transition from Guyana to England, even though I grew up in, 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 in England, you still had an, an awareness of yourself, of your identity, of your colour, and nothing much at the environment at that time. For, for you to get even a book by a, another black poet, you had to go to a black bookshop. Um, it was, um, I know things have changed a lot, and there are now more black writers, um, um, such as John Agard and Grace mm -hmm. Nichols on the curriculum, which is fantastic. But back decades before, there wasn't so. So there was always this desire, as within the 16th and 17th, the emergence, when you hear there's Angela Davis, that the awareness of black culture was there and the need to go to more towards mm -hmm. Africa for the roots. Um, and where I moved to in Harrow, again, there was a, a much more mixed um, nature of people in terms of residence, and it did spark my um, attention, the need for mm -hmm. coming back to where we've come from. And I'd look and I'd compare, you know, why are black people, people of West Indian origin, not doing that well in, in schools? And I'd, and I'd look at, I'd find the need my, myself to kind of like link up more with the, the African culture. And indeed, whenever I said I came from Guyana anyway, people would say, you mean Ghana? And I'd say, no, people haven't got the geography right. And yet, Having studied myself, even to write some of these poems, it made me go back and look. I thought there's got to be the connection, seeing where we're coming from. One, one of my ideas in the, writing the poetry was I felt many young people weren't in touch with where they came from. The African children in schools were perhaps their parents would take them more readily back home so they would be more in touch. Maybe every couple of years they'd go back to Nigeria or back to Ghana. They knew definitely where they came from. They knew, they saw the role models, the aunties, the uncles who had aspired and become this and become that. You know. Um, taking their positions of authority and um, prestige in society, and yet many of the young people who, who've left even Guyana, if they're, like, they're peer, my peers, for example, if their parents haven't brought them back, they they lack that connection with their cultural past much more beyond that. Um, and oftentimes, when children studied Black History Month, for example, they said, "Oh, you mean we're doing work on slavery?" And and, I, and, and they didn't go break that. Before to the time before slavery. No, they didn't. So and I, I, I like that in your poetry because going through your book, especially this poem, "Fashion Me a People." Yes. Uh, the first line says, "Fashion me a people, rhyme me a rhyme, reveal me a history mm -hmm. back in time." Mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. takes us way back, yes. uh, even before slavery. Absolutely. So, uh, but I want to get because our time is running mm -hmm. really quickly. Mm -hmm. So I really want to get into your poetry. Yes. And I was hoping you can actually read me a piece yes. uh, that you wrote. I'd love to do that. There's one that comes to mind, again, um, connecting the relationship between um, Guyana and, and Africa. I hope it's adoption. It is very much <laughs> adoption. Adoption of a theme that's very close to my heart as well. I was birthed by Mother Africa, but quickly removed from her warm, safe womb to continue life on Caribbean shores. Of Ghanaian descent, they told me, reflected in the people who came. The land of Guyana, my parents' country, I took to my heart, patriotic from the start. I had my flag, map, and national song. El Dorado City cheered me along. The desire to achieve my parents instilled in me. They worked hard for little money. But they built on the foundations of our ancestry. Africa, not England, the mother country. Africa, not England, the mother country. As I have grown, I've learned to absorb the good of the past 
and laid the rest to waste. For many hurts can slow the heart down, can make it bleed, can bring a frown. Amazed by our little known history, descended of kings and queens, who me? Yes, many facts and artifacts too. Well, you know what a little knowledge can do. So make it your business to read for yourself and get a conviction to help you excel. May the limits to your success not be self-inflicted. As you grow in knowledge and help expand your mind, may you see your blackness, your culture, differently of the positive kind. You know, what I, what I specifically like about that poem mm -hmm. is that although it talks about you coming away from Guyana to go to live in England, mm -hmm. you still said Africa, not England, the mother country. Mm -hmm. So although be. you were, in my mind, adopted by England mm -hmm. from Guyana, mm -hmm. the mother country, yeah. still remains Africa. It has to be. And that's, that's what I really like about that poem. So quickly, uh, Ms. Vidal, lastly, if someone wants a copy of your book, how, how can they get it? Where will you be? For a whole, how much well, longer will you be in Guyana? Well, I'll be in Guyana up until um, Monday, Monday afternoon. Um, but it is possible to get hold of it. I could leave some here with a representative at the studio so that you, they, if they contact you, um, I can leave you some copies here. Apart from that, it's also on Amazon. Um, so that it's possible to order it from there as well. But I am contactable. Um, and I do have a website, which is www.marketingpoet.com. Um, is there a contact number for you? There is a contact number 079-57-871-718. Is, is there a Guyana number you use? There is a Guyana number, but I can give that to you and you can probably okay. put it on. Yes, afterwards. because you might not. Yes, if it's okay. true. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you the Guyana number for Miss Vidal. Any final words? I, I would really like to encourage, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to writing some more. I, I think it's really important for us to know our history um, and to, um, to take the time to read about it and to write. Um, I hope that the young people who I met yesterday at St. George's High School will actually take me up on that and be encouraged and to make the most finding out about their history so that they can actually have the vision for how much they can achieve and contribute to their country. So that's my message for them. Thank you very much, Ms. Vidal. I Thank hope you, you continue to shine. Thank and you. do remember, make it shine. Get a copy. Let's see how you can uh, contact Akemba, contact Ms. Vidal. I'll give you her contact information mm -hmm. later on in the program. So you can definitely get your copy of Make It Shine. A uh, whole book, 50-something um, pages of inspirational poetry. Now we're going into a video that tells us a little bit about our history. It's going to talk about the African Museum in Ghana, the Museum of African Heritage in Ghana, done by the president of Akemba, who started the program, Mr. Kibwe Copeland. Take a look. Welcome to the first episode of Valuing History. My name is Kibwe Copeland, president for Akemba, Youth Organization for Reparations and African Development. And I'm your host. What are we talking about? Let's find out. In the beautiful land of many waters, home of a people who are diverse and rich in culture, with its population being divided into six races, Africans, Amerindians, East Indians, Chinese, Portuguese, and a mixed race, our country's motto being one people, one nation, one destiny. One would ask, what is the origins of this land and its people? History is taught and preserved through several art forms, practices, teaching, institutions, etc., such as poetry, music, movies, social and traditional practices, schools, storytelling, monuments, statues, museums, paintings, and most of all, people. On this episode of Valuing History, we are going to take a look back into the past and by taking a tour through a history-preserving institute. And that institute is no other than the Museum of African Heritage, said to be the first of its kind in the Caribbean. Located in Burima Avenue, Bellier Park, Georgetown, Guyana, originally called the Museum of African Art and Ethnology, was founded in the year 1985 with the purchases of collections of African art of Mr. Robert H. Nicholson and Mistress Desiree Malik. These collections were annotated and accessioned through UNESCO by Dr. William Silgman, curator of African and Oceanic Art, Brooklyn Museum in 1992. 
the museum was declared open in 1994. Since then, donations from local community have continued to include art and craft brought from the African community here in Guyana. The museum has collected pieces from the Borough School of Art and other day-to-day -day artifacts from local communities. In 2001, the museum was renamed the Museum of African Heritage in order to open their doors to a wider audience and begin to fully address the African experience in Guyana. Question, what is the mission of the African Museum? Who is responsible? Who manages this museum? The Museum of African Heritage is a non-profit institute created by the government of Guyana to collect, preserve, exhibit, and research art and artifacts relating to Africa and the African experience in Guyana, and to disseminate this knowledge through its outreach program. The Museum of African Heritage today falls under the Ministry of the Presidency, Department of Social Cohesion, Culture, Youth and Sport. Ms. Jenny Daly, the appointed administrator, manages the day-to-day -day functions of the museum, accompanied by five staff and three volunteers. But more than when the museum was founded, why and how it functions, what is found in this history vault? As is mentioned earlier, the Museum of African Heritage has a wide collection of arts and artifacts relating to Africa and the African experience in Guyana. Much of its collection are examples of the kind of art objects found in West Africa and there to educate us on the meanings and reasons behind African art and traditions. Some of these are formed, some of these exhibits were brought from Africa directly to Guyana by Mr. Nicholson. From African musical instruments, neck rests, masks, African games, domestic tools, enslavement artifacts, sculptures, animals, African symbols to information on slavery, slave rebellions, reparations, monuments, statues, etc. One of my personal favorites, and ideal to start with, since we are talking about history, is the Sankofa bird. Sankofa is a word in the Twi language of Ghana that translates to go back and get it. San to return, ko to go, fa to fetch, to seek and take. And also refers to the Ashanti and Drinka symbol represented either with a stylized heart shape or by a bird with its head turned backwards while its feet face forward, carrying a precious egg in its mouth. Sankofa is often associated with the proverb, so wo where fina wan Sankofa a yenkia which translates as, it is not wrong to go back for that which you have forgotten. Another favorite and more popular artifact is the African drums. Traditionally, the drum was the heartbeat, the soul of most African communities. Drums have been an intrinsic part of African life for centuries and for countless generations. An ancient instrument used to celebrate all aspects of life. They are used as an alarm or a call to arms, stirring up emotions for battle and war. They can also inspire passion and excitement and even cause trance, a momentary loss of consciousness to either the drummer or the listener. They symbolize and protect royalty and are often housed in sacred dwellings. They are protected during battle. On the other side, drums are about communication and making music two essential characteristics of community life. For centuries, the talking drums were a primary source of communication between tribes, used to transmit messages, sometimes across great distances. This next artifact, I wouldn't call a favorite, but is also very popular and known, not for its benefits to the African people, but to our destruction. The slave shackle. Plantation owners and overseers use heavy iron shackles to punish and humiliate def defiant enslaved Africans, both men and women, and especially those who try to run away. Enslaved Africans who have been sold were also shackled while being moved to another location. Arm and leg shackles were the most common type of restraints, but stocks, neck collars, and the ball and chain were also used. This pair of iron leg shackles is typical to the kind used on the southern plantations in the 19th century. And when we talk about history, 
It is our history that African people were enslaved and brought to this part of the world, Guyana, with shackles and chains on their necks, on their wrists, and on their ankles. They were brought to work on the plantations and fields over a period of 200 years or more. And this is our history. So, a people without knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. Marcus Garvey. Habari Mimini Kibi Koplan Ninafrura Kukutana Nawewe. My name is Kibi Koplan. It was been my pleasure to share all this information with you on value, valuing history. I hope you've learned something. If you did, share. Until we see you next time. Wahiri Tunana Teno. An amazing piece by the president of Akemba on the Museum of African Heritage uh, in Guyana. I'm sure lots of persons, uh, and I speak with a lot of people. Sometimes I'm at the museum and I say, you know, hey, I'm at the Museum of African Heritage. And where is that? We have a Museum of African Heritage. Uh, I'm sure uh, a lot of people do not know that we have a music Museum of African Heritage. And I encourage you to actually visit the museum and see for yourself um, some of the interesting things that they actually have there that really speaks to African history and culture. Continuing with our team of African history and culture, we're going to go to another video uh, of an African leader, the great Kwame Nkrumah. So, enjoy. Ghana, we now have freedom. Africa wants a freedom. Africa must be free. Oracles indicated that Kwame Nkrumah was a devil. Mr. President, Mr. President, there is a coup. I've never seen such an explosion of joy. Accra, Ghana's capital city and the largest city in the country. The word Accra is believed to originate from the Akan word Nkran, meaning ants. It is no wonder that you will see men and women hustling and bustling under the blazing sun to earn a penny or two. In these very streets, walked a great man, a man who led Ghana's liberation struggle. His name, Kwame Nkrumah. It was during his reign that Ghana made great developmental strides, like the building of the Tema Township, the Accra Tema Motorway, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, the Great Akosombo Dam, and of course, his key role in the formation of the Organization of African Union. With Kwame Nkrumah beyond the borders of Ghana, he is hailed for his achievements. This decade is the decade of African independence. Forward then to independence, to independence now. Tomorrow, the United States of Africa. Uh, to him, African Union was a passion, and I think he's right. Look at what is happening in Africa now. Congo, the richest country, what is there now? Uh, warlords all over with uh, this private enterprise from outside. They do what they like. I mean, and look at what is happening in all Africa. He had, he foresaw that if we didn't come together, we would be in our present state. Dr. K.B. Asante was the Secretary of State during Kwame Nkrumah's rule. He recounts Nkrumah's character. He could be charming when he uh, wanted to, but Normally, uh, as uh, someone who worked with him, he was uh, what I would call a charming, hard taskmaster. He was a good dancer, 
and he liked music, yes. And we would hear music. I, I, but I remember high life music around us. His smile was infectious. Perhaps you didn't hear what I said. <laughs> that was the charm of Nkrumah, a man who was very committed uh, to Africa. Nkrumah lived and died Africa. In September of 1909, in a village in the Gold Coast, as Ghana was called then before independence, a son was born. Francis New Year Coffin Gonioma, to his father a goldsmith, and his mother a retail trader. This name later changed to Kwame Nkrumah. Nkrumah was educated at the prestigious Achimota College in 1930 and thereafter became a teacher. Nkrumah was a very ordinary human being, he was human like all of us. He was born in a very small, tiny village in the western region of Ghana. He had his education, Catholic education, uh, went to Achimota School, initially wanted to be a Catholic priest and eventually taught in the Achimota School, which was the most prestigious high school in, under the colonial rule. At the age of 26, Nkrumah left the Gold Coast to study at Lincoln University in the USA. He read widely from the literature of Karl Marx and Marcus Gave. And from then on, ideals of socialism became appealing to him. Nkrumah was very much uh, inspired by uh, Marcus Gavi and the whole idea of uh, return to Africa and black freedom. That inspired him a lot too. So he knew about all those things. Uh, that would have uh, fueled his ideas for a kind of pan-African consciousness and the need to rally a wide range of people in pursuit of what he wanted. In the United States of America, he came across, you know, writings of George Padmore and co, who were in the Pan-African movement, W.E. Du Bois and all. And eventually in 1945, he linked up with them in Manchester, United Kingdom, where they organized the Fifth Pan-African Congress. And they decided to accelerate the struggle for liberation of Africa. As men of thought and action, they exerted great influence on the young Nkrumah. His ideas for the unity of all Africans later came to be known as Pan-Africanism. In his book, I Speak of Freedom, Nkrumah wrote, Divided we are weak, united, Africa could become one of the greatest forces for good in the world. After 12 years of being away from the colony, Nkrumah was invited to become the Secretary General of the first ever political party in the Gold Coast, the UGCC. Nkrumah and the founding members of the party were later known as the Big Six. 1948 was the year that saw the Gold Coast go through perennial unrest that resulted to boycotts and mass action. Goods that were brought in by Asian, Lebanese and European traders were too expensive for the locals to afford. There was a boycott of British goods because people felt that the association of West African merchants, which included all the uh, British and expatriate firms, uh, uh, had raised prices far uh, beyond uh, the uh, capacity of Ghanaians. The colonial government blamed the leaders of the UGCC for stirring up trouble, and this led to the arrest of Dr. Nkrumah and the UGCC party members. They were imprisoned in James Fort and were charged with instigation, looting, and rioting. The imprisonment did not deter Nkrumah from his continued opposition against British rule. His arrest did not in any way dampen enthusiasm within the party that he had founded, largely because some of the activists remained outside the prison wall. 
1951 was the year that saw the Gold Coasters voting for self-rule. By this time, Kwame Nkrumah had split from the UGCC to form his party, CPP. In 1951, the party that he formed out of the United Gold Coast Convention, which was the Convention People's Party, won a landslide victory in the general elections. And he became the leader of government business, or more or less, the prime minister of the Gold Coast at the time. In the struggle of CPP, there is victory for us. CPP had a big following. The youth, particularly, believed in Kwame Nkrumah and his ideologies and actively campaigned for his release. After the party's landslide victory, the pressure on the colonial government to free Nkrumah increased. At Accra, a huge crowd cheers as Kwame Nkrumah leaves James Fort Prison, freed by the governor as an act of grace on the eve of the inauguration of the new constitution. The British governor, Sir Charles Arden Clark, eventually recognized him as the prime minister. Between 1945 and 1965, a significant number of African countries gained independence from European colonial powers. Ghana became the first African country south of the Sahara to gain independence on 6th March, 1957. When the Gold Coast successfully get your independence official, Ghana, Ghana is the name, Ghana, we wish to proclaim, we will be just... That we are going to say that we create our own African personality and identity. We dedicate ourselves not only in the struggle to emancipate all the territories in Africa, our independence is merely led on letting the legs of the total reflection of the African continent. Jerry Rawlings, a former head of state, remembers the mood of the time. We were playing football and I could hear this siren and everybody sort of stopped wherever they were listening to the siren. But of course, I mean, not me. I was chasing after the ball and I found I was the only one chasing after the ball while everybody was listening to the siren when I ran into a barbed wire. And that's the scar I have here, yeah, on that day. Those who have hats on, to take up your hats and let the band play our national anthem. And from now on, that national anthem is the national anthem of the Gogo to be played on all occasions. The mood was electrified. Everybody was seeing the dawn of a new beginning. This was the day on which he said that the African was capable of governing himself. And he said that we as Africans should be allowed to make our own mistakes. That was an incredible day. Its freedom served as an inspiration to other African countries struggling against colonial rule. And as a result, Ghana occupied a central role in the fight against imperialists. On 31st December 1957, while in office as Prime Minister, Kwame Nkrumah quit the Bachelors Club. Fatia Ritz and Kwame Nkrumah became husband and wife a few hours after she landed in Accra from Egypt. This was a marriage that baffled many. It was not understood why Kwame Nkrumah asked for a bride from Egypt. She did not speak English and neither did Kwame speak Arabic. Mother was a young woman from a different culture. Uh, she left her family to come and, and her home, home base to come and live here. So I think it was a challenging marriage in a sense, but I think I remember her saying she would do it all over again. He, I think, 
did not marry her because she was in love. I think he just felt that it was time for him because of his position. He was then uh, prime minister and then uh, eventually became president in 1960. I think he needed to have that image. Together, they had three children, Gamal, Samir, and Seku. From a previous relationship, he fathered a son, Francis Nkrumah. We had an ordinary ch childhood in the sense that uh, our father, when he was at home, he was a very modest, um, simple man. So I remember uh, playing around him, all of us. But I remember little things. I came insisting on giving us a spoon of honey because it was good for us. <laughs> yes. It wasn't long before that Kwame Nkrumah's regime started going through the mill. By declaring Ghana a one-party state, he was perceived as a dictator. So with a one-party system, everything became all Nkrumah, and that was wrong. But you see, that again is a total misunderstanding of African history. Almost all of the African states which broke away from the colonial yoke, established one-party states. Do you think one-party state is good for democracy? If it wasn't democracy, then they should, they should have left us with their colonial masters. They did not force us. I waited one day when it was a good, good mood alone, then I said, Sajifu, why do you want a one-party state? Then he said, you know, I have established so many industries and institutions, and I don't have enough competent people to man them. Many of the people who can do, do this are in the opposition. And that was a while later I found the only way out was to have a one-party state, so we all belong. His predicament did not end there. He went ahead and implemented the Preventive Detention Act this gave him power to detain anyone he deemed a threat without a trial. All his bills were passed through Parliament, even preventive detention bill. He didn't just get up and say, I, Kwame Nkrumah, from today, I'm having this law. No. He went through the process, went to Parliament, and Parliament passed the preventive detention bill. The elite in those days were against this dictatorial type of governance. And so, the opposition to Kwame Nkrumah increased. How can the person who led us to struggle for the right to elect our own leaders become a dictator? The person who led us in struggle to assert our rights as human beings become a dictator? Strange, strange logic, strange definitions. It was his own people, his own government, that gave him away because he was becoming a nuisance. As Nkrumah walked in the gardens of Flagstaff House, which served as his residence, he was the target of a failed assassination attempt. One day he was walking from his office, you know, from his house to his office, and the policeman opened fire on him. What was he to do with that policeman? give him a bouquet of flowers and kiss him on the cheeks for attempting to assassinate him? I don't understand these noises about dictatorship. In August 1962, Kwame Nkrumah was returning from Upper Volta, present-day Burkina Faso. A grenade was concealed in a bouquet of flowers and given to a school pupil to present to him. It exploded. It was at that point that the bomb was thrown. It caught him. The girl who was going to present the flower died on the spot. The fragments went into all his body from his nipple down. 
Alhaji Suleimana Yeremia was detained during Kwame Nkrumah's regime. He was accused of being behind the bombing. You in Ghana here just mentioned the bomb and my name will be one. When you look at the trial, I was not alone. If it were you, what are you going to say? Do you take it or you leave it? At that point too, it was a matter of death. When you assign it to me, I would not accept it. But there is every indication that says that I was the one. Ghana's economic condition started to get bleak. Cocoa, its primary export, had started experiencing a decline in the world market. Unemployment. Welcome back to Akembo. Everything history, everything youth, everything African, everything black. You were just watching a video on the life of uh, the first Ghanaian prime minister and president, uh, African revolutionary leader and politician Kwame Nkrumah. Unfortunately, we are out of time. And so I'd encourage you to uh, check YouTube and look at the video for yourself and see it to the end uh, and actually take in the history and get the story. For persons, we, and for persons who got this, uh, start viewing this late, you can check on our Facebook page, Ikemba, I-K-E-M-B-A, and you can get the whole video, which is live and will be saved on the television. Mr. Copeland. Uh, the history, uh, what's, it, what's it, what's the name Valuing of the history? Are, are you two? Valuing history and trend, what's trending? Valuing history and what's trending. So Kibwe, from now on, will have a feature on the program called Valuing History and What's Trending. It started today uh, and it was an amazing feature and like Kibwe said, check or check the campus Facebook page. Uh, you'll see uh, our live, which will become a video after. And um, check our Facebook page for everything. We'll, we, keep, we keep updates and we, keep, we plan to do Some these types videos of videos. Much more uh, often. Yeah, much, much more often. So thank you very much for watching, and we hope you have a good rest of the evening. Kibbe? Well, good night, everyone. Please hey. do have a blessed evening. Yeah, man.